Raghunath sir, I'll introduce you uh, very uh, briefly and probably at the end we will uh, again go to yeah, Raghunath yeah. so that no we can start the session back, right? No problem. No problem. Uh, I welcome you, sir, Dr. Pearlson Kanaga Sabapati, sir, who's yeah. a professor with Padmashri Institute of Physiotherapy, director and course instructor with Federal uh, Federation of Indian Manual Therapists, Bangalore. Sir, uh, uh, very warm welcome to you and thank you for accepting our invitation uh, to uh, uh, you know, share your knowledge with us uh, and uh, guide us through manual therapy. So he is going to talk about integrated manual therapy uh, for osteoarthritis in knee. Uh, thank you so much, sir, and uh, you can please start off. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sai and uh, Dr. Raghunath for sparing your time and uh, uh, calling me to share my knowledge with you. Ho hopefully, you know, it will be helping few budding and clinicians. Yeah. Shall I go ahead? Yes, sir, please. So, uh, good evening, one and all. Uh, I thank uh, KSPF for uh, inviting me to share uh, knowledge with you regarding this uh, integrated manual therapy for OANE. Okay, so it's a more of a reasoning process in which uh, how do we go through or how do we, you know, look into OANE because uh, uh, generally people look in OANE and they may not be able to, you know, thinking that uh, can we use manual therapy or can we use exercises or can we use both or can we use, uh, you know, modalities alone or you know, something else. So I'm trying to make easy and simplify here saying that, okay, how integrated or a manual therapy can be helpful for OANE. It's a process of, uh, uh, reasoning and uh, as I said, you know, myself, uh, Paulson, who has done uh, Master of Physiotherapy from University of South Australia, Adelaide, in the year 2000, and um, consultant at Badmishri Diagnostics, and as well as you know, professor in Badmishri Institute of Physiotherapy, and uh, founder for Federation of Indian Manual Therapists. Through this, uh, I have trained more than mm, you know, 10,000 physiotherapists all over the India and all over the world. Yeah, so let us get into this. So what we are going to talk about the presentation is, you know, the biggest question is, uh, oh, it's a million rupee question, so a million dollar question. Uh, can we really apply manual therapy to osteoarthritis of knee? First question. Second question is you know, how we are going to apply it and what are the ways in which, you know, we can use it comfortably. And when you see this picture, you know, you see here uh, uh, eroding meniscus, bony spurs, eroding cartilages, exposed bone, all these factors, you know, will be there in uh, OANE. So will you be able to apply it or should we look in, you know, certain criteria or should we follow certain things in order to, you know, apply this manual therapy. So that's what we're going to, I'm going to uh, craft and simplify things, you know, which is uh, easier for you to understand on my expertise over here. So there are a lot of criteria, you know, which comes around uh, with uh, osteoarthritis. So one of the things is that uh, a grading done by Callaghan and Lawrence grading scale. Okay. So what is the reason for putting across here is, uh, uh, if you want to choose the patient or if you want to choose uh, the appropriate uh, OAE person, so we should be choosing a grade one and grade two for manual therapy, which is more appropriate. And we do have you know, a mild to moderate amount of evidences for mild to moderate uh, you know, presentation of OAE. That is grade three also can be applied. But it's a more of, you know, I would stick to more of grade one and grade two that we can apply this the manual therapy. So this is the one thing. And as we look in, yeah, the, in uh, x-ray is not going to be the definitive uh, criteria to choose or, or say that, you know, they have a OAE. But uh, 
of course, you know, you could think about seeing the joint space and other factors which could be talking to. So no features of OE, which is a normal, and doubtful is a minute osteophyte or uh, doubtful significance. And then we have, you know, uh, osteophyte and the normal joint space, and it goes on like that. And yeah, this is, you know, again, uh, kind of uh, how you look in with this uh, grades, like in you know, the four grades, and then you talk through with the different various presentations. And this is for anyone to understand that uh, narrowing of joint space and possible osteophyte limping, which could be there, or then, you know, definite osteophytes a definite narrowing of joint space. So these are the two things uh, which we are going to choose for uh, doing a mobilization. And grade three and grade four, we are not going to talk about, or we are not going to do mobilization. Yeah, we can do mobilization, but at the same time, you know, the mobilization is not going to be effective, or you know, it's going to be um, maybe you know, in terms of uh, uh, symptomatically, which we can apply. So. Yeah, when you have a early OA or a late OA, we will have the inflammation. So when we have an inflammation, you know, it's uh, always in, in the inflammation is more, it's uh, likely to be the early OA. So early OA comes with a lot of inflammation, the synovitis, and which could be causing the pain. And mostly we know that like, you know, one of the criteria for OA and E is uh, medial joint line tenderness, so when you have a medium joint line tenderness, you know, it could be because of the uh, synovitis. And both early and late OA will have the inflammation, but it's a more in the, you know, early OA, so which can be picked out by palpating the medial joint line. So this is, you know, devastated or, you know, worsened knee in which we are not going to think about uh, doing a mobilization, but sometimes what happened, uh, you know, they might be having a good range of movement. Uh, they may be having good uh, functional performance. So always, as I said earlier, we are not going to do anything with uh, only the X-ray. We are going to look in, you know, the physical perform performance of the uh, patient. Yeah, so what are the things which you're going to cover here is uh, the clinical pattern of uh, OA and E. So what does it say or how we have to, you know, identify it with the clinical expertise and what are the manual therapy approaches and demonstration of the technique. So these are the things, you know, which we are going to uh, learn or, you know, look into in this uh, hour. Yeah, so why do we choose manual therapy? So the first, uh, and the foremost thing is to reduce the pain. So when you want to reduce the pain, you're going to think about manual therapy and as well as to improve the physical performance by addressing joint kinematics. So these are the you know, few points which we need to look. So if I want to say indications for manual therapy is anyone who has a pain and as well as if they are you know, limited in their functional activities. Okay, so what happens in OA in me in terms of you know manual therapy, or uh, what kind of you know efficacy we get through the manual therapy? So loss of periarticular flexibility, they will be having loss of periarticular flexibility, so you will be having restricted movements, capsular contractures, and increased intercapsular pressure in OA. &E. So these are the things you know which happens in OA. &E. So how does it work or uh, how manual therapy works for pain? As we all know, like, you know, we have a neurophysiological effects. So a neurophysiological effect, through neurophysiological effects, we have influences of the pain. And as well as manual therapy enhances the Golgi tendon organ so that, you know, it causes a muscle relaxation or via reflex inhibition. So as you look at, you know, any, any type of manual therapy, which has got a neurophysiological effect or a mechanical effect or a vascular effect. So this also goes on the same way, like neurophysiological effect and as well as, you know, it relaxes the muscle. So when there is a muscle inhibition, okay, when there is a muscle inhibition, it is going to cause reduced concentric muscle contraction and then the muscle tension in the periarticular structures. So it's going to reduce this. So when it reduces, it, it reduces the pain. So that is how, you know, it will be helpful to treat the painful knee. So any painful knee can be treated. And all this, how, like, you know, uh, 
uh, like uh, we can say as a uh, immediate impact and at the same time you know it's not going to have uh, a long duration effect or long duration impact or you know you can say as a, a shortened impact due to this mobilization and how manotherapy works for functional disability so when you say functional disability you know it is more like you know we are working on the neuromuscular system so so when the neuromuscular system has to be worked or has to be activated, so the mechanical stimulus will change the neuromuscular system. So when the neuromuscular system will activate the neuro kind of you know, neurophysiological mechanisms, and this mechanism is going to correct maladaptive movement and to improve functional disability. So you know, in today's world, you know, many patients come to us saying that I'm not able to walk, I'm not able to climbing up, or I'm not able to move around, or I'm not able to do that. Or functionally, you know, they will be limited. So they're not able to get into the auto or get into the car or anything, you know, any kind of functional activities that they get limited. So as we look, there are two things which we talked about here. What manual therapy works is reducing the pain and as well as, you know, increasing or improving the physical performance. Okay, so this is what happens in the OME and how you know, manual therapy works and neurophysiological effects and as well as the inhibition which causes you know, changes in the concentric muscle contraction and muscle tension in the periarticular structures which reduces the pain. Yeah, coming back to the treatment. So whenever we want to treat, you know, we need to have a technical proficiency. So the technique of manual therapy that we need to do or how we are going to work on which has to be taken care of. and the communication skill. So how we are going to you know talk to the patients and the knowledge base. So this all overall I would say as a clinical reasoning. So when you say clinical reasoning, you know the clinical reasoning has got three components. One is uh, cognition, metacognition and knowledge base. So these three components are going to help us to get better with the treatment, but it's not all alone. If you say evidence-based practice, okay, so evidence-based practice is uh, nothing but uh, not only the evidence system research and as well as it's the active involvement of the client and as well as the patient perspective and input and as well as the clinical expertise and the experience of the therapist. So all these three put together, you know, we get the best effective outcome or best effective treatment in terms of the OENE or any conditions in terms. Okay, so when I say, yeah, when I say uh, like with, you know, clinical reasoning, so there are two types of groups of people. So one is the, uh, expertise and one is uh, a novice. So uh, the novice always goes with backward reasoning. So backward reasoning is uh, uh, nothing but, you know, going through the hypothesized categories. And the expertise will be going through the forward reasoning. So we have two types of reasoning, which, we, which is more effective. So one is the uh, back, backward reasoning, that is the hypothesis categories. And uh, another one is, you know, the forward reasoning, which goes with the uh, pattern recognition. So when you say that hypothesis categories, it's nothing but in the assessment which we do, which we intend to do always with the people, like you know, whenever we have any kind of uh, uh, dysfunctions or MSK patients. So one is the activity capabilities or participation capabilities, or patient perspectives, or pathobiological mechanisms, or the tissue sources. So what is the tissue source, or what are the structures which causes the pain, contributing factors which causes the pain, or the dysfunctions, and what are the precautions and contraindications to be taken for the physical examination and the treatment, and how do you manage this patient on prognosis. All this, you know, we go step by step and come to the conclusion of the prognosis, so that's what the hypothesis categorizes. So hypothesis categorizes is nothing but backward reasoning, which you know, novice has to go, go through without knowing you know, the pattern recognition. So that's a more important thing as a beginner, as a student, you know, as a budding therapist, we always go with you know, 
hypothesized categories. So that's not what we have uh, the big assessment chart in our you know, schoolings where we go through all these factors. And the second one is a pattern regularization. So this is the pattern regularization or, or the expertise or the clinical experience of a person. So when I say like, you know, a forward reasoning, taking directly, okay, if you have this, this is what, what you say with, you know, the OAE. So what are you going to do with this? So we are trying to find out, you know, what way the patient is affected. So they are limited in daily activities and the patient may grasp around the knee and indicate that the pain is felt deeply in the bone. So they feel it's a more of a deep pain, so which could be due to the bony pain, a nature of pain, which could be impinging or intermittent. So this is the pattern regularization or uh -huh. forward reasoning or clinical pattern of OEA knee. Okay, so when we look in, in this, mm -hmm. we, we also ask the patients about saying that, you know, what are the aggravating factors? Or in, 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 ter in, in terms of aggravating factors, okay, huh. so what do you mean by aggravating factors is like squatting, mm -hmm. oh, kneeling, yeah. sitting to standing, all this could oh, be yeah. the uh, aggravating huh. factors. And then the relieving factor oh. is the rest. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay, so relieving factor could be the rest. So this could be the pattern regularization. So these are the uh, commonest things which we understand from the patient saying that, you know, why they are, what are the activities which causes the dis uh, dysfunction or the disability or the you know, limitation of the person. And so And mostly, you know, people say that, you know, it's, uh, have a lot of swelling, uh, have a big uh, kind of swelling in the knee. And this could be probably because of the suprapatellar bursa. So suprapatellar bursa can cause a swelling. And when you say history, yes, gradual onset, which could be there, and weight bearing whenever we walk, whenever we jump, whenever you move around, whenever you run, or whenever you walk through, through uneven surfaces, you know, you will have pain. And the source of the symptom this is where, where we have to be careful and we have to listen. So source of the symptom is from the subcontinental bone. So the source of the symptom is subcontinental bone. That's the reason why, you know, TKI is more effective or TKI or surgical interventions are more effective rather than going on with, you know, the kind of uh, conservative management because it, uh, the pain is coming from the bone. So are we going to fix the bone? No. We are not going to fix the bone by doing mobilization. So probably, you know, uh, that's why the surgical intervention is more successful. So what are the other factors, uh, contributing factors, the gait patterns, loss of joint mobility, loss of muscle strength, and they might be having the deformities like genital and genital gym. And probably, you know, people will have wasting of quadriceps and gluteus. So that's the reason why, you know, a lot of studies which has proved that, you know, hip, uh, ex hip uh, extensor or hip abductor strengthening gives a lot of uh, reduction in the pain in the OAB. And, you know, we have been doing for years and years with quadriceps and the hamstrings also. And that will be a, probably a component of tight iliotibial band. So when you have a iliotibial band tightness, you know, where we need to work on it. And not to forget to do the accessory movements and the physiological movements of uh, tibiofemoral joint, and as well as not to leave hip and lumbar spine. So this has to be checked, or this has to, could be the source of the pain. So when you, when you say that, you know, this could be source of the pain, we really need to find that, you know, what could be leading into that, or what could be causing it. Fine, so coming to the treatment, okay. So this is where we're going to do the treatment techniques for uh, the OENE, as I told you, is a grade one or grade two can be fixed in. So there are two things, you know, which you're looking. It's uh, the treatment is mainly for symptomatic relief. And we are not going to do anything with the pathology or the imbrunation of the bone, which is the cause of the pain. We are not going to touch anything, but we can, prevent uh, for the patient getting further disabled. Okay. Uh, so what are the techniques which we have here? We have a longitudinal cephalot and caudal, a posterior anterior that glides, and medial and transverse. And rotative mobilization is uh, found to be very effective. And, and these kind of things, you know, I would say like, you know, we have yeah, a lot of 
there is it supports this also but at the same time you know it's a very clinical and anecdotal and clinically you know it goes to uh, reduce the pain so they are reduced the pain so obviously the patients are comfortable with that and this is where you do with the ap glide now you don't need to start with the 30 or 45 degrees of knee flexion, you start with uh, 10 degrees, 15 degrees, and progressively increase. Because a end range of mobilization can cause or uh, can affect the uh, meniscus because the meniscus is also likely to go for degeneration. So we have to be careful with the end of range mobilization. Uh, the glides, you know, the lateral glides or the medial glides, which we can do in order to get better. And then we have the rotatory mobilization. So, value. so when I say with the rotatory mobilization, we have to remember that 15 degrees of internal or external rotation has to be done. So if you do an internal rotation of 15 degrees, it's going to take away the contact pressure on the lateral side. Or uh, if you do an external rotation of 15 degrees of tibial external rotation of 15 degrees, it's going to take the contact pressure on the medial side. So you know, vice versa. So medial or lateral side, you try to choose this rotatory mobilization. So when the contact pressure is taken off, the loading has been taken off and it can reduce the pain. So when it reduces the pain, you obviously, you know, you'll be able to feel better or comfortable in terms of uh, reducing the symptom of the patient. And you can see here a video which uh, talks about, uh, go through this techniques So the first one is uh, you know the longitudinal yeah you can say like you know inversion and aversion of the foot uh, longitudinal cephalid and caudal which opens up the medial joint space and the lateral joint space okay so by doing an inversion aversion of the foot you don't uh, if the patient uh, doesn't allow you to touch the knee or you know you you find it difficult to go through the knee region, then you can always go with, you know, inversion, aversion, or, you know, moving away from the uh, joint. So that is Marty? inversion, aversion Marty. of the foot. Yeah. 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 So, okay, but then uh, your microphone is unmuted, Bartada. So once uh, you have done that, you know, you have this glide, CAP, yeah. AP, and medial and lateral glides, which we can do in order to reduce the pain and as well as the rotatory mobilizations. So these are the things you know, which we can uh, do in terms of uh, reducing the pain with the joint kinematics or the movements you know, which the joint does. And if you choose on with you know, people who have a involvement, like uh, you want to have a more amount of uh, you know, distraction component has to be added, you can lift it off and then do the same. And the next thing, you know, which we are going to do in this, uh, look into this video, is about the component of neural mobilization. So the component of neural mobilization can be taken care, that is the saphenous nerve, because of the infrapetalar branch of uh, saphenous nerve comes on the medial side, you know, which, which can also mimic, particularly after arthroscopy, where people can have a medial knee pain, so which can cause us uh, some kind of a discomfort on the medial side that we can do that. So what you're going to do is the saphenous nerve mobilization, you're going to put the person in prone lying, keeping one hand on the pelvis and another one on the knee. And you can see that the lower leg is supported on the arm. Okay, so this is the starting position. And obviously any kind of mobilization, you know, we are going to do it in a walk standing position. So you do that and then take it into abduction and the external rotation by swapping the hand, uh, dorsiflexion and inversion, and then you know, you've got the knee extension as the mobilization. So you, this can be done you know, well or good enough, fair enough to know that if there is an implication, okay, not everyone. So as I told you, there are a lot of studies which proves that you know, the post arthroscopic or post surgical, there is a possibility of this uh, involvement of saphenous uh, uh, intrapetal branch of saphenous nerve so that we can do this you know, uh, mobilization. 
I like. So when we look back with the techniques, okay. So we did the few techniques like we talked about a longitudinal cephalot cordon, the posterior anterior and the anteroposterior movements, the medial and lateral transverse movements, and the rotatory mobilization. So these are the techniques you know, which we can do in terms of manual therapy in order to reduce the pain or in order to reduce the uh, symptom. Okay, so that's how we did that. So I will go through the video again for you to look in. So longitudinal cephalot coral by keeping it in straight position where you can do a inversion and aversion. And then you have this, our usual AP and a PA glide, which can be done. And then we have this, you know, the lateral and the medial glide. Yeah, and as well as the rotatory mobilizations. So this is what we do, or what we did with the uh, or in the presentation. And this is where like a long lever, keep the knee in a flex position, give a distraction, and then do the glides, APPA glides, okay? The next we are going to see, again, the cephalus nerve mobilization. We're going to put him into prone line position and keep one on the pelvis, lift it up, duct, externally rotate, yep. And then, you know, inversion and then do the mobilization, yeah. So that's, uh, uh, that's the thing about the, you know, the demonstration over here for the techniques. So you can do taping, yeah, because uh, it can reduce the pain then instantly, and yeah, it's not for a long period of time. Okay, it doesn't stay for a long period of time to get away from the pain. So you can do the taping, which can be used with. Uh, uh, rigid tapings, or you can use, you know, people does use nowadays uh, that kind of tape and other lucrative tapes which can be used. So one of the things which we do with the tape is uh, patient stands with his knee flexed five to ten degrees. So that's a uh, uh, functional position, like and he inverts his foot, and then you diagonally put the tape. Okay, so you are trying to maintain the uh, internal rotation of the tibia, so which could be done in order to, but you know, you can't have this, this I'm talking about there, a rigid tape, and it's not going to be there for a long period of time, maybe, you know, 24 hours, but the efficacy is for five to seven hours. So obviously, you know, if anyone comes, comes to you saying that I'm not able to walk, I'm limping, I'm not able to, you know, do a small movement also that we can use this taping. And this is about the cephalus nerve, which we talked about, the components of hip extension and abduction, hip extension and abduction, then the knee extension, hip lateral rotation, and then the ankle dorsiflexion and the aversion. And you do have a lot of articles, you know, which supports the various treatment techniques. And we, we can, you know, we, we have a lot of studies which do that. And clinically, if, uh, of course, you know, some of you would have utilized it, some of you are not. And probably, you know, it's uh, like using the pedalar mobilization, pedalar glides. So you can see on the picture one uh, that, you know, you keep the knee in a flexed position and keep uh, uh, your web space over the patella on the superior aspect of patella and then ask him to do a knee extension on his foot, so which can be done in order to help the person to get better. So we can probably do these techniques in order to treat the, the myofascial component or you know the various other factors because there will be a capsular contracture which could be one of the factors for the OEME that you can do this. So what you do here is you know you keep the knee in a flexed position, keep the hand or the rest space on the superior aspect of the patella, and then you keep it, hold it like this, don't allow him to give off, and then ask him to do the knee extension. Okay, so that we can do that, which in order to uh, work on for reducing the pain around surrounding the patella or you know, surrounding the knee joint. Uh, yes. We do have you know, plenty of other techniques which we talk in terms of uh, uh, treating around the surrounding structures. So surrounding structures can be treated with like the transverse frictions to the lateral retinaculum with the fully extended and the fully flexed positions. Tilt, 
the anterior tilt, medial tilt, the posterior tilts, or the lateral tilt, which can be applied here, or you can maintain the medial glide and you know ask them to get into flexion extension mode. So each session, so which we can do for all these moments, which we can do for a number of times. Uh, loss of knee extension. So you you do have a difficulty in pain, or they will have a kind of you know symptomatic pain, and as well as they will have a loss of range of movement. So when you have a loss of range of movement, we do the combined movement. The combined movement comes with the knee extension with valgus or abduction or knee extension with varus or abduction. So which we can do the combined movement in order to help, uh, or we could say this as a, a scoring technique in order to increase the range of motion. So the same way for the knee flexion also. Uh, knee flexion can be you know, effectively increased by uh, doing the internal rotation or by increasing the uh, rotatory mobilization. So I would say like, you know, not only with the internal rotation, so you can do an internal or external rotation, which is more comfortable or which is more symptomatically free for the patients. Okay. And yeah, you do the patella glides, which can be done as a kind of soothing techniques, like how we do a pendula exercises for the shoulder, that we can do the, you know, the petal arc lights, which will help and which has to be done in five to 10 degrees of knee flexion. And muscle tightness, so a lot of muscle tightness could be the reason for the pain, particularly for the people with the, uh, the limitation in their activities. So all this muscle tightness has to be assessed and then you, know, you have to really treat the same if at all recurred, like Already I mentioned about the anti band, which could be shortened. Uh, not only that, you know, all these muscles would have, uh, will have an influence on the knee. So, like quadriceps, hamstrings, gastrocnemius, adductors, iliosaurus, and the tensor fascia later, and the tibial band. So, you do the mobilization around the joint or soft tissue mobilization using the media and other things. Or, Superpetalar so and prepetalar regions for you know value stretch, value use with your thumb in order to reduce the tightness around those regions or over the medial and lateral joint capsule or the popliteal fossa. That's it. Yeah. So when I conclude here, we have the treatment techniques wise. The Maitland techniques, which I talked through with, you know, these are the techniques which we can do. And then you do uh, excuse have- Excuse me, sir? Yeah. Uh, Russell, sir? Russell, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, there's uh, some uh, uh, feeble voice that's coming. Can you yeah. please speak a little louder, sir? There's some requests that's coming. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so I repeat again, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, we can. so yeah, so I repeat again, the techniques which we have done through is the longitudinal cephalot and the caudal or the posterior anterior, anterior posterior movements, medial and transverse glides or the rotatory mobilization. So this is what we've gone through. And as well as, you know, you can do the taping in order to relieve instantly the pain and you can do the saphenous nerve mobilization also. Uh, this is more for you know, post arthroscopy or which likely. And we have a myofascial mobilization technique that we have to keep the knee in a flexed position and then you know, keep the rest face over the uh, top of the patella and then hold it over there and try to increase the. Uh, ask them to do the knee extension, yeah. And then we have a lot of small, you know, techniques which we all are aware of. So one of the component is the knee extension loss that we got to do with, you know, combined movement with the knee extension with valgus or abduction or knee extension with varus or abduction. So which probably, you know, done in order to increase the range of motion of extension. And the knee flexion can be done with the help of the internal rotation of the Tibia, yeah. 
And pedal glides can be done as a soothing technique for increasing and to keep away, like you know, keep doing the movements over there. And a lot of muscle which goes for tightness, which has to be looked upon. The quadriceps or hamstrings or gastrocnemius, adductors, iliosaurus or tensor fascia later. Yeah, and IT band. And all these techniques can be done here. That's it, sir. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank yeah. you so much. Raghunath, sir, you're in now? Is, is his audible? audible? No? Voice? He's a... Yeah, your voice yes, is sir, audible, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Fine, sir. Fine. Done, sir. Done. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. yeah. Sir, yeah. you can take some take the questions from the panel. Uh, you have any questions, sir? Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, sir, sir, one of the participants yes. is asking to repeat the practical uh, demonstration, sir. Is it possible to do it? Yeah, yeah, we have. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the this is uh, inversion aversion of the foot, which is also called longitudinal cephalar and cord. And then you know you can do in various degrees of for uh, AP and PA glide, I just done it in uh, 30 or 40 degrees. And then we have the lateral glide and the medial glide. So depending upon the pain and then the rotation. So when you do rotation, you have to remember that, you know, we got to do around 15 degrees of rotation of the tibia. And this is another one, like uh, where you do with, uh, you know, uh, long liver with the 10 or 15 degrees of flexion. And then you keep, uh, you can see the, uh, fingers on the joint and then you give a distraction a little bit if possible and then try to do the glides there. Yeah. And this is the saphenous nerve mobilization mostly for uh, post arthroscopic pain or you know kind of uh, discomfort on the medial joints joint region which could be due to intrapetular branch of softness now. So the components are hip extension and you get hip abduction, lateral rotation, and you know the knee is extended at the end and where you have a hand over the foot or the plantar aspect to get into dorsiflexion and aversion. Yes, sir. Can we ask the next question, sir? Yes, sir. Sir, next question is from uh, Johnny Gerald Kilutus. Yeah. Okay. Who do you, John, uh, Johnny, sir? Okay. Hello, Joni Gerald, you can ask your question to... Oh, sorry, sir. Yeah, yes, Joni. Sir, in fact, it is a very nice uh, presentation for new upcoming uh, physiotherapies. Oh. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, yeah, yes, you are a senior physiotherapist. <laughs> can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, uh, I don't have any questions, sir. Nice presentation. Thank you for your uh, repeat participation. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, uh, Johnny Gerald. Uh, yeah. The next yes, question sir. is uh, Dr. Sh uh, Srinivasulu M is want, want to ask a question to you. Dr. Yes, Srinivasulu M. Yes, Please go ahead with your questions. Yeah, can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Srinivas. Uh, hi, sir. Yeah. Very, as usual, like excellent one. Being your student, I'll be yeah. happy always to attend you. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, as you said, yeah. this one like rotation mobilization, is it? So I have doubt yes, like sir. that rotation mobilization we are doing to enhance the screw home mechanism, is it? Or oh, you see, I, uh, I've uh, gone through 
recently a study which they have done a cadaveric study okay, okay so where they are trying to find out uh, the impact of this rotation movement okay so how this rotation movement uh, can help uh, you know osteoarthritis of knee okay, okay. so in that uh, if you do a 15 degrees of internal rotation okay mm -hmm. so if you do a 15 degrees of internal rotation it can take away the uh, lateral contact pressure okay so it can unload you know that area yeah okay, okay. so you do the la lateral rotation it can unload the medial area okay, okay. so that's because the reason why like yeah that's the reason why we can't go with screw home mechanism saying that internal rotation for flexion and the external rotation for extension okay, okay. so okay. symptomatically whichever rotation is comfortable for the person you can do the same Okay, thank you, sir. Because in uh, JOSPT journal, just I saw an article saying, yeah. like in uh, internal, uh, sorry, uh, external rotation of the tibia and doing the extension, it will enhance the screw home. Method. So I got some doubt in that. That's why. Thank you okay. so much, sir. No, right. sir definitely, it go, if you go with biomechanically, that's a screw home mechanism. It happens. Okay. Yes, sir. So which uh, can be used for a stiff uh, knee. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Sir, so this we are is talking sir. about. Yeah, we are so, talking sir, about uh, you know. Yeah, we are talking about uh, two things here. Okay, the manual therapy in terms of OE it's only to uh, symptomatically to reduce the pain. Okay, and another one is the uh, physical performance or functional. You know how to reduce the functional disability. Yeah, thank you, sir. So this Stefanus nerve mobilization can we do in the post TKR or something? Is it uh, advisable? Oh, oh, or? Oh, oh, oh. So there are, uh, you know, quite a lot of studies which they have done uh, after nailing uh, for uh, those who had knee pain, anterior knee pain. So they have not done the mobilization. So they have done, you know, desensitize the nerve to find that is that going to change. Okay. okay. So a, a, a clinic, uh, as a research study, you know, it has not changed much. But uh, I, I would take it in one perspective. So like if you have a CMC arthritis, okay, yes, a carpal, carpal metacarpal arthritis, which causes a dysfunction in the thumb. Yeah. Okay? yeah. So, which in, in there was a study uh, which uh, was yeah. So, which uh, where we can do a radial nerve mobilization. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. You yeah. Heard, so, yes, uh, 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 yeah. So, on that clinical anecdotal, okay? okay. So, it's a purely a clinical anecdotal. So, where we can do a stiffness now, which can reduce the sensitization over the medial joint line. Yeah. Okay. So, that's a point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, can I go with one more question, or is it fine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have enough yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, clinically, like we, while we are doing the physical examination, how we can yeah. differentiate whether it is like a, a CMC uh, condomalacia patella, CMP, sorry, condomalacia okay. patella or fat pad, fat pad impingement or something, sir? Okay. So when you have a clock test positive, so like you know where you do uh, the compression test of the patella, you know, which could cause us the pain. So which could be the the pain will be behind the patella. Okay. Right. So when you have a fat pad impingement, it should be probably it should be at the, above the tibial tuberosity and the patella rather than anywhere else. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Uh, Perlchen, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, the next question is uh, from the Facebook. Uh, Bhuvana Dakshinamurti uh, is asking a question. Should I give all the glides for osteoarthritis knee uh, is the question, sir. Mm -hmm. Uh, when, when you we have done the assessment, or uh, if you look back with my pattern recognition of the clinical pattern of OENE, we are going to assess the uh, tibia femoral joint. Okay, so whichever joint or uh, whichever movement is going to correlate with the sim symptom, or which is reproducing the symptom, so that can be chosen. You don't really need to choose everything. Right, sir. Uh, one more question uh, from uh, Gangadhar. He yeah. would he want he wants to know what is your stand on PRP injection and how far the manual therapy helps after PRP injection in uh, OA knee grade three. He wants to know, sir. Yeah, my experience with that is uh, it's not really you know uh, uh, outclassing the other things. Okay, it's not changing much. So I I, I would not advise people to go for it if I have given the option. Okay. Okay. One more uh, question yeah. from uh, Vinosh Kumar Purshottam. He wants to know what is the dosage for manu manipulation and uh, nerve gliding, sir? 
Yeah. So the manipulation you can do for you know period of time like uh, uh, 100 boats each glide. So like 10 into 10, or and uh, half of that can be done for uh, the neural mobilization. So neural mobilization has to be done you know half of what you do with uh, uh, articular mobilization because it is sensitive in nature. And another thing, there are a lot of factors, you know, uh, we can't just go with the numbers. So the things, the severity, irritability, nature of disorder, and the specific pathology, all this will tell you that, you know, uh, what uh, really could be the dosage. And we don't want to give a numerical number. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Great, sir. Okay. Now, uh, there is a question from... Uh, Baby Lal Rinkimi, I'll put you on to baby. Uh, you can go ahead with your question. Yeah. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can. Uh, okay, yeah. good evening, sir. Uh, Dr. Parson, uh, the presentation yeah. was so good. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have one minor doubt. So, yeah. uh, when we uh, do mobilization for the knee, especially, uh, why yeah. is the uh, tibial component only addressed and why is not the femur uh, mobilized? Uh, that is my question. Yeah, so you can do like you know, the concave and the convex rule can fit in. Okay, so when you say with that, uh, the concave can be moved here on this aspect rather than the convex surface. And it's not that you know you don't need to. You should not move femoral component. Okay, and and very recently people have broken that there is no con concave convex rule which can be fixed into manual therapy. Okay. So that's a very latest thing, a trending thing, which we can say in manual therapy. But uh, I, I would say like, you know, you can move both, but predominantly we move more of uh, the concave surface, that is the uh, tibial condyle rather than the femoral condyles. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, one yes. question from Chandrakant Das would want to ask a question. Chandrakant Das, you can please go yes. ahead with your question to Pearl sir. Yes. Chandra Kandas, you can post your question, please. Is uh, unavailable. Uh, Rajkumar Sundarajan, please go ahead with your question. Rajkumar Sundarajan. I think he has come. Chandra uh, Kandas. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Ra uh, Rajkumar Sundarajan, can you please hold uh, so that... Uh, okay, one of you. One of you can go ahead and post a question. Uh, Rajkumar Sundarajan. Good evening, sir. Uh, it's yeah. a really wonderful session, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, I have one doubt uh, for uh, Contra Malaysia Petala. What is the, what yes. kind of uh, glides we can give, sir? Because uh, I am seeing few cases, I couldn't yeah. able to uh, give the manual therapy treatment. Uh, mm -hmm. So, could you please uh, give some uh, guidance yeah. about what kind of uh, manipulation uh, for uh, Contra Malaysia? So, when you, when you say petal femoral arthritis, if they have a petal femoral arthritis, this mobilization is not going to help, okay, compared to the tibiofemoral joint. So if you ask me what, what could be the treatment technique which we can do, is uh, like you, know, you can work on with uh, working on in order to find out the uh, drifting of the patella, and uh, you can use uh, taping which can be done, and as well as you, know, you assess the muscle which goes for the weakness, or particularly the BMO or anything else. Uh, which can be treated with. And I always say, like, you know, when, when it comes to knee, apart from mobilization, uh, we think about the above and the below component. That is, uh, a hip and the ankle muscle strength has to be taken care of rather than the only the quadriceps and hamstrings. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. One more doubt uh, for regarding that yeah. uh, uh, mobilization for the extension we want to give for. Uh, uh, lateral rotation of the tibia and we need to give mobilization. Am I right now, sir? Uh, if you're thinking about a stiffness, okay. Yes, sir. Stiffness, yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, we, we can go ahead with the lateral rotation. But, uh, you know, on, on, on clinical practice, on clinical expertise, if you ask me, I just try to find out whichever component is causing the dis uh, hindrance. That has to be chosen rather than, you know, you go more uh, like biomechanical. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, hello? Thank you, sir. Yeah. So, uh, hot peg or cold peg, which is more effective for uh, any? Mm, yeah, we can do hot. Okay, sir. In grade 2 or grade 3? 
Uh, you see, you, because uh, see, when you look in with the basic thing, there are some people who are not good with the uh, cold therapy or they don't like the cold therapy to have an impact okay, on the joint. And most likely people are um, 80 to 90% of people are happy with the heart pack. Oh, I would okay. go with that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kulten, sir. Uh, sir, one question uh, uh, from Isha Sharma. What uh, she wants to know is, what are the limitations of pandemic therapy uh, age group regarding OANE? That's what they... Uh, uh, yeah, the so, so, OANE itself, you know, it is 45 plus or more. Okay. So, that's the area where you're going to apply it. So, I don't look into that uh, uh, age limit there. So, until unless uh, they fall in the category of grade 1 and grade 2, of uh, osteoarthritis, then we can do mobilization, irrespective of the age. Oh, thank you. We are thank not you. doing a we are not doing a manipulation. We are doing a mobilization. Okay, that that answers the question. And uh, sir, one question from Facebook question: uh, Shri yes, Jesh uh, okay. wants to know closed kinematic or open kinematic exercise, which is best for uh, OANE. Uh, which is best for OANE. So you can do the, you know, hip uh, strengthening or uh, the close kinematic chain exercises. Both both can be done. It, it, it doesn't make a big change in it. That's what uh, I would say. I would say. Because, you know, when you say with the weight bearing, like you know, we do a lot of uh, activities with uh, a concentric or uh, like you know, what we say as a quadriceps and hamstring isometrics, which can be done with that. And very recently, you know, when I was going through this, isokinetic exercise of uh, quadriceps is much better in terms of exercises. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I, uh, I think uh, that's it, sir. I, um, uh, Hello. Any more? Am yes. I audible? Yeah, 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 very much. Uh, when we uh, go for TKR, I mean, uh, OE. Mm -hmm. And which, which condition? Um, go for TKR, total knee replacement. Yeah, correct. Yeah. When? Uh, at the time, when? Which right, right, right. So when, when they are crippled, you know, when they are not able to do their functional activities and when the pain is uh, severe more, then you have a lot of criteria to look into that. Okay. So where they can go for a TKR. And I would say like, you know, if a person is really crippled, not able to do that functional activity, then he has to do a, a TKR. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> Any more questions, sir? <laughs> So just one second, I'm just checking. Uh, so one last question, sir. What kind of exercise uh, should we carry out on OA patients? This is a very generalized question. What do you? What is your uh, answer for this, sir? So OANE, OANE, where you can do a manual therapy, and along with that, you know, you start doing the hip uh, hip component exercises and the ankle component, along with the quadriceps and hamstrings, will be very handy rather than. Uh, doing only exercises because when you look in in terms of uh, evidence basis or when you look in terms of you know uh, outcome of uh, the whole researchers we talk about exercises uh, like you know hip strengthening along with ankle and as well as ankle in a sense you know I'm talking about the inversion aversion components and as well as along with the quadriceps and hamstrings which will be helping the patient much better rather than you know, we, we come across every year, we come across with a new thing, but uh, this is uh, one thing which will go much better, handy rather than, you know, whatever comes new with uh, different findings. Thank you, yes. sir. Thank you. Uh, one more question has come in by uh, Nidhi Agarwal. Uh, what yes. she wants to know is, is there any role of uh, wearing a kneecap? Does it, is it going to help the patient any way while wearing the... Maybe, maybe a proprioceptive effect. Oh, Maybe okay. proprioceptive, uh, because many uh, I, we all know that you know after wearing the kneecap, people get into swelling a lot, and it becomes another big issue. So you know.
if, uh, if they are comfortable. Many people feel that they need to have some warmth around the knee, which uh, gives them a constant relief. Uh, they feel more psychologically saying that, okay, when I have some kind of uh, support, I feel better in walking. So that could be the reason. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, one Facebook question, sir. Ashish Paul wants to know, which, which gives the best results? Is it make Maitland or uh, Mulligan? <laughs> what is your take on this? I would say manual therapy and the exercise is the best. Okay. Between Maitland and Mulligan? There are a lot of studies which say that both are not good. And it's for <laughs> instant relief. Instant relief. <laughs> <laughs> if you say instant relief, you know, yeah, both the, both both gives. And we have a lot of studies uh, from uh, Maitland concept for OE. Okay, rather than bullying, but uh, both both are you know wonderful technique to follow. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, sir. Yeah. Yes, I think uh, we are uh, done with the question, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raghunath, sir, for being the moderator for today's uh, webinar. Uh, it was really wonderful to have you. Thank you, person, sir. You know, uh, I'm sure you know. Uh, whenever we uh, listen to your lectures or your uh, talks, we would like to hear more and more of it to gain our knowledge. And uh, I'm sure you know all the participants here would uh, take a lot uh, to learn from this webinar. And uh, it's it's been a wonderful session, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And I would uh, want to speak, sir. Yes, yes, yes please, sir. please, sir, please. Yeah, yeah. I, I would want to thank, uh, <laughs> you know, this was supposed to be done at the first uh, start of this, but then uh, it was indeed a, a great presentation, uh, 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 a great initiative by KSPF to organize uh, and host uh, this kind of learning module uh, and knowledge sharing platform. Uh, I would like to appreciate the whole team of uh, KSPF, very, very tolerant, uh, uh, Dr. Ayapan, President KSPF, Dr. Sai Mahindra, the organizing chairman for this webinar and uh, general secretary of uh, KSPF, Dr. Vinod Babu, the executive uh, committee member, KSPF, uh, and uh, all our friends, uh, most importantly, Dr. Yuta uh, uh, the syndicate member, uh, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Sai Kumar, who is a Senate member uh, for their continuous support and all the beautiful uh, things you have done over a period of time, series of uh, webinars which has uh, uh, been done uh, during the COVID-19 uh, lockdown. It is a um, great platform, uh, a great learning module for uh, student professionals and a great initiative. I thank you all for choosing the right panelist. Thank you, Paul Sansar, once again. Simon, and I'm sorry I have technical issues. Thank you, thank you. It, it happens, sir. You know, it, it happens with everyone. But thank you so much for uh, being a part of our uh, webinar. Sir. Thank you so much. Pleasure, pleasure is mine. Thank you, sir, once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, KSPF, for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.